territoriality, mate choice, developmental plasticity, and I know him well from his lovely work on honest communication. He's also very involved in outreach and grad student training, inclu including lots of grad student training grants, um, including uh, K through 12 outreach and education. So I'm thrilled to have him here today to talk about sexual selection and parental investment in a fast and changing world. <laughs> Thank you, Liz. I, uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. Is this too loud? I hope not, because I don't know how to deal with it. Um, so uh, thanks. I want to. Uh, I, I spent many years here, and I saw many uh, old alums come back uh, and get all misty-eyed and talk about their life's career. And I'm, uh, I, I'm not planning to do that. I want to talk about a couple of projects that I've uh, just finished and not finished yet. Uh, um, and they actually fall out into these two categories, something to do with sexual selection, which is a chapter in a book that I, uh, I have to say, buy this book, um, and uh, then a paper that we, a manuscript we have uh, in review and I'm, uh, we're still working on. Uh, I wanna start with, a, um, although I said I wouldn't burden you too much with the alumni stuff, I feel like it's uh, kind of obligatory to have uh, my alumni story, uh, alumnus story. Um, and um, this is the day that Sewell Wright came to town. Uh, I think John was probably there. And John, don't correct me if I'm too wrong. I don't want facts to interfere with a good story. Um, so um, I, I, I presume most all of you know Sewell Wright and the important role he played as one of the, uh, the founding fathers of the modern synthesis, uh, born in 1889, got his degree at Harvard, um, 1915, working on uh, coat color in guinea pigs, uh, developed path analysis and all those other things he's famous for. Uh, on that day in Ann Arbor, which was about 1979, I'm not exactly sure when, uh, he would have been about 90, whoops, about 90 years old when he came to town. And um, he gave a talk at 410 over in the Modern Languages building. He was very old and very famous, and it was a giant auditorium packed with people. And he started off the talk uh, by explaining why um, uh, Fisher was wrong and Haldane was wrong and Wright was right. And that's such a good, uh, such a good uh, catchphrase that uh, we're still using it. I had a, we saw, I was at a, a job interview last week and afterwards Rich Lichlinski came up and told me about why right was right. Uh, was right right or right wrong? Um, so people still argue that. So anyway, Wright started his seminar at 410 and uh, it, he started off by explaining that. And then he went into his research and he uh, was talking about uh, his work on guinea pig uh, the genetics of gu guinea pig coat colors, and it was pretty engaging, and he was going along. And uh, by and by, people realized he's just coming to the end of his thesis in 1915, and it was 510. And you could see everybody looking at each other, like, I, I gotta get the kids from daycare, and, uh, but I, ca I can't walk out on this guy, he's too famous. Uh, uh, what am I gonna do? And uh, it, just, it was just amusing to watch the eyes right and left. So uh, about t uh, 5.15, uh, whenever Fisher, would, or wherever Fisher, whenever Wright would turn his head this way, the people on that side of the audience would get down like this and try to sneak <laughs> out. And uh, same thing the other way, if you look here, people are getting down. So at about 5.30, uh, uh, I got down and snuck out and there was a picture of a cow on the uh, screen. And I'm not sure what he did with cows, but um, uh, uh, it was quite the experience. Now it was also, I hate to say that it was uh, amusing or that I laughed when I read an obituary, but uh, Wright lived another nine years, almost 100 years old. And when he died, Jim Crow wrote a really nice, uh, sweet obituary in genetics. And deep down in the obituary, he tells the story about how Wright uh, just always ran over. He couldn't stop. And his wife, Louise, repeatedly asked him to uh, shorten his talks, but he just couldn't do it. He would always run over. So there I was laughing at an obituary, sorry to say. So, uh, uh, so what? Uh, so I want you to know that I know full well that I am not Sewell Wright. Among other things, I'm uh, not that old. Um, and uh, so, uh, on with the show. I know that you guys will get up and walk out if I don't uh, finish this on time. So I want to start out talking uh, about stuff in this book chapter by the book. 
um, looking at um, questions about what maintains genetic variation to allow uh, signaling systems to persist and not disappear. And the, uh, the basic story I'll run through quickly and then back up and do it a little differently is uh, this is a standard issue uh, a problem. If there's heritable variation in mate quality that's correlated with uh, uh, some condition dependent signal, then things are expected to happen. Now I'm, very gri I'm using very glibly the term quality because people, that's the way you use the word quality, it's kind of a glib term. But what I mean is it's something of value to uh, a potential mate. I'll call a shopper in an attempt to avoid the standard stereotype, but I'll quickly lapse into the standard stereotype of males and females for convenience, okay? Forgive me, but it's just shorthand. So uh, uh, either uh, indirect genetic benefits or direct help uh, is um, the quality that a shopper might be searching for. So the idea is if you have the variation, there should be selection for choosiness um, uh, if the search costs aren't too high. Signals and preferences co-evolve. Uh, high quality big signalers are selected. Uh, variation in signal quality uh, should disappear and then the system will collapse. So uh, uh, that's set up as a motivating uh, scenario. So uh, I'll do this over again as a graphic novel because uh, I find it's more fun and I'm going to use these symbols later. So here's that story as the graphic novel version. Um, there's variation in some phenotypic trait that's correlated with quality, whatever that means, and redder is better, and we have this variation. Uh, females, uh, some females might have no particular preference. Uh, another problem in signaling theory that I'm not really going to address today is um, how the uh, system gets booted and started. But let's just assume that there's some uh, variation in female preferences and some of them are choosier than others. And uh, if the uh, search costs are not too high, then there should be selective selection for preferences. And uh, choosy females will then begin to uh, select for the more uh, high quality signaler. Um, and eventually, redder is not better because there's nothing to be better than and there's no variance left. And then the, the system will uh, either lapse to a low cost uh, situation. Maybe this is cryptic and well camouflaged or it could cycle depending on the uh, particulars. So this is the same old problem, what maintains heritable variation. Uh, and that was a, a part of the focus, a big part of the focus of this book, a contributed volume. Um, edited by Hunt and Hodgson, uh, Hodgson that um, uh, I have a chapter in that I'm going to tell you a little bit about. So, so here's the book, by the book, uh, on chapter two, uh, uh, genotype environment interactions when information transfer is uncertain or incomplete. So the focus of this is uh, pulling out uh, work I've done on uh, the what you would expect to happen to the evolution of female preferences as uh, male traits um, evolve in the co-evolution. Now, uh, Hannah Coco, Holman and Coco have an excellent chapter. Uh, these are pretty good complementary chapters. Coco's uh, chapter is a very sophisticated genetic model of the same problem. It has a very simplistic approach to female preferences. Mine has a, what I think of as a sophisticated approach to female preferences and a crappy uh, genetic model, so I'm not really a genetic modeler. So between the two of us, uh, we've kind of boxed the problem in, and uh, luckily it, um, we draw the same conclusions. Now, um, um, grad students, buy this book. Uh, um, uh, in case you're a grad student and aren't aware of it, the reason people put chapters in these kind of collected volumes is to try to get uh, influence grad students because nobody cites these things and uh, very few people read them. But the hope is that uh, grad students will read it and this will help shape the way you design your research. So buy this book. Okay, so I want to take this issue of uh, um, how genotype environment interactions might influence uh, signaling systems. Uh, all the way back to uh, a paper by Richard Lewinton and, uh, uh, called Analysis of Variance and the Analysis of Causes. 
And it really is relevant, so uh, bear with me till we get to the bottom of the slide. Uh, and I love, I love this paper for a lot of reasons, but one of which is I uh, would love to hear uh, Lewinton uh, uh, saying, I've got some very annoying conclusions. If you uh, know him or know his work, you can just picture him kind of giggling when he says, oh boy, I got some very annoying conclusions. Um, at any rate, uh, he makes the point that uh, there's a big difference between anal uh, analyzing uh, how causes might interact and trying to partition uh, causation into this or that. And uh, he points out that that's a fundamental problem in the history of nature versus nurture. Um, and uh, please keep in mind that this is 1974. So uh, he says this is a, this is a big problem with this uh, nature nurture partitioning causes. He makes the assertion which, uh, it, that dynamical systems in an early stage of their evolution uh, show large main effects but over time, the main effects uh, uh, are selected away, and you're left with uh, interactions. It's actually a very bold statement about uh, the, uh, the loss of main effects, and it leads to uh, the, his argument that really what we're interested in in this sort of analysis are norms of reaction, which I assume you're familiar with, and somehow this has been cut off. So sorry, down here is a two. And up here is a one, I think. Uh, yes, so that should be G2 and that should be G1. Environment, phenotype, genotype. This, is, this genotype does well in this environment. This genotype does well in that environment. This is a perfectly symmetrical G by E. Um, and he points out that um, then the relationship between phenotype and genotype is a many-to-many -many relationship. Um, you don't have a clean mapping of uh, from phenotype to genotype, or from phenotype to environment. Uh, it, it's uh, an interesting problem. So uh, grad students, uh, this is a timeless paper. You should read this paper. Uh, after I pulled it up and dusted it off, I decided I was going to make all the grad students whose committees I'm on, I'm going to make them read this, because uh, I'd forgotten how good this paper is. So what does this mean, or what does this have to do with uh, G by E's and mating markets. Uh, well, in, in essence, uh, um, a choosy female, sorry, I'm going to leap right to it, uh, is in essence trying to discriminate the causes of phenotypic variation. And here's a way of looking at it um, from the, oh, we got the ones and the twos back, from um, Lewinton's um, um, uh, norm of reaction to my uh, uh, cartoon representation. So a female searching amongst these males uh, could not just from appearance uh, tell whether something that looks like that is G1 from E1 or a G2 who's come over from E2, uh, discrimination problem. Down here, is this uh, G1 from E2 or is it uh, G2 from E1? Uh, so we have a many-to-many -many relation that's part of the problem for a female who's trying to choose male for uh, indirect genetic benefits, uh, uh, she can't peel out the G from the E because of this crossing. An additional com uh, uh, complication that I'll try to clarify uh, is <clears throat> the issue of not only what genotype is behind this phenotype, but what environment will the offspring go to? We're going to talk about migration. And uh, so uh, it depends uh, if you mate with this individual and has my, there it is. Oh, I think my batteries must be dying. If, this, if you mate with this individual, uh, will his offspring, uh, your offspring with him, end up in this environment or this environment? That's another part of the story. So um, Let's uh, back up and put this further into the context of sequential search. So imagine that females are searching around and encountering males uh, in uh, some random uh, renewal process. And uh, uh, d the decision is, do I settle and mate with this male or not? So the, the, this is a search uh, discrimination and settle model. And uh, we'll start off with a very simple example that is, in essence, just uh, your classic optimal diet model. There it is, optimal diet model. So we have a female who's going to be searching an environment 
for potential mates. And I'm going to see if, uh, I guess they took it, we'll be fine, for uh, uh, potential mates. And uh, the environment is uh, a probabilistic uh, um, um, device and the female searches. And let's say uh, in this search, this iteration, by chance she encounters a male that looks like that. And uh, you, in a, just a basic uh, decision uh, model framework, you can ask should she accept that male or not accept that male. So I'll uh, give you a moment. Somebody want to blurt out, uh, do you think you could answer that question or not? Given how little I've told you, should she accept that male or not accept that male? Well, the answer is you really want to know a whole lot of stuff. You want to know additional things, but uh, in the end, the answer is going to be yes, because given the environment that I've described here, there aren't really any better males out there anyway, so there's no reason to go out and search for more. Uh, yellow's as good as it gets uh, from that environmental urn. So uh, search is costly. Um, the value of uh, giving up, rejecting the male, and going out and looking for something else will depend on uh, how far it is to the next urn, what's the probability of different types in the urn, um, and, uh, well, basically that, and the cost of getting from urn to urn. So um, that's just basic decision theory stuff. Um, in this case, it's, uh, I can't think of any, uh, any circumstances where she should not accept that male because the urns don't have anything better, so there's no point in searching. So that, that was easy, uh, a little warm-up exercise. Let's then uh, do it again. So, uh, let's say another female starts this thing and uh, wanders the world looking for a mate. And in this uh, iteration, this woman by the woman, <laughs> sorry, shoot me. This uh, female, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, this female happens by chance to encounter this male and uh, ask, should she accept or reject? And now it seems not so obvious. Uh, or is it? Should she just go ahead and reject it because this is a crappy male? Um, because there are better males out there in the world? Well, maybe yes and maybe no. Uh, it depends on the search cost, the distance to the next encounter, time to the next encounter, the risk, the probability of getting killed uh, in the search. Uh, she should go ahead and accept this if search isn't expected to lead to a better outcome soon, if urns are far apart, and uh, the proportion of uh, yellow-tailed males in the urns are pretty low. Uh, or maybe more intuitively, you should reject them if you could expect to run into another urn and uh, hope a, that a, a yellow male pops out of it um, and the expectation is higher. So basic, this is just basic search theory, and it's not really different from the optimal diet model, but it, uh, I want to emphasize how much it depends on the cost of search. The decision is, is accepting this male uh, uh, better or worse than going out into the world and wandering around and hoping that uh, next iteration uh, turns out better. Now I want to transition, so that's all just basic introductory decision uh, diet sort of model. I want to get to the signal detection uh, problem that's uh, at the heart of where we're headed. And that is that, let's imagine that there is developmental noise. So we have two genotypes, G2, G1. We're only looking in the one environment, E1. There are two genotypes. Uh, and this is a condition-dependent trait. So this is a high-quality male, this is a low-quality male. But for developmental reasons or perceptual transmission reasons, there is a distribution function. Most of the, this is what the modal uh, low-quality G2 looks like if it grew up in E1. Um, uh, but some of them are worse condition, some are in better condition. This is the modal. Some of them are by chance in better condition. Some of them are by chance in worse condition. And suppose she wanders uh, through the world and by chance encounters a male that looks like this. Now what? Now what? What are the things that uh, would go into the calculation of trying to figure out what's the optimal thing to do um, in that situation? So uh, uh, just point out, it wasn't uh, necessarily the case, but I just happened to do it. I just point out that if you look at this, 
you're equally likely to get a male that has this appearance from this population as you are from this population. So in fact, this color tells them nothing from a, uh, this is a, should get ahead, this is a Bayesian decision problem where there's, uh, you imagine that the female is going into this with prior expectations about the probabilities, and then she is updating the priors based on the present Q. In this example, this doesn't change the posterior uh, at all because it's equally likely to have come from this or that. That's not my point. Uh, it's kind of an irrelevant point, but I wanted to bring it up to sort of help you make sure you understand what, uh, what the thinking is here. So it's just a, a, a particular kind of a Bayesian uh, uh, detection, discrimination problem that uh, happens to be called signal detection theory. And it's the same as before. It depends on the value of search and it depends on what are the posterior expectations of the value of something like this. So imagine that it looked like this, or that it looked like this, or that it looked like this, or it looked like that. Those will change the posteriors and then those have to be compared to uh, the expected value of renewed search. Will I come upon something better um, anytime soon before I get killed? or the season ends. So yes, if search is not expected to lead to a better opportunity quickly. No, if uh, the posterior value is low relative to the expected value. And it's all just a bunch of equations. That's not a big deal. But the optimal Bayesian discriminator should set a threshold somewhere and say, I'll accept anything that is above that level or above that level. Uh, if search is very dangerous, uh, in general, they should be uh, less choosy and accept anything that's better than that. If search is very cheap, uh, it's not uh, a lot of mortality risk, time is not a big issue, um, then you could be very choosy and only take individuals that are above there. So those are all basic uh, signal detection uh, expectations. So uh, that's, uh, that's uh, signal detection theory phenotypic variation, genotypes within one environment. We're still warming up uh, towards the issue of genotype environment interactions. Uh, if you have a question, wave your arm at me. I'm used to that, and I don't want to lose anybody entirely. Okay, so this is uh, just transcribing my cartoons from uh, uh, an urn device to the standard way you would look at this in the signal detection analysis. So this is the distribution, frequency distribution of the uh, uh, genotype one in environment one, the good match genotype environment. This is the frequency appearance distribution for the uh, bad uh, genotype environment match. Uh, and I've scaled them, uh, the, the distributions to be, um, reflect the, the relative abundance. So these guys are doing good in this environment. These guys are not doing very good in this environment. These are immigrants, which are zero. So, so far there's no immigration. I'm just showing you the basic signal detection problem. And then the issue for female is to set that threshold. Uh, what we're gonna see in a few slides, this is a little bit ahead of the game, is that <clears throat> I've told you again and again, the, um, the decision criterion should depend on the search costs. So in the modeling I've done here, I have not only our males uh, uh, have a G by E, but females have a G by E. So males who have the right to grow up in the environment uh, where it's e1, G1 and E1 are in good condition, and that's them. These are males who have G2 that grew up in E1, and they're in poor condition. But females of G1 and E1 are presumably in good condition and would have lower search costs. And so they could be more choosy because renewing search is less costly. They're healthy, they're in good condition, they can outrun the fox, um, and they're not about to drop dead of starvation. A female who uh, is a G2 in E1 and grows up in poor condition uh, ought to be less choosy, uh, so this would be a, a female in bad condition. These are all completely arbitrary numbers I've plugged in as a heuristic exercise. So basically, uh, if an in, a female encounters a male that looks like this, and she's in good condition, she should reject him and go hunt for something that looks like that. 
if she's in bad condition and search is uh, more costly, she should accept them and only reject fewer of them. I hope that's uh, working okay. Now, uh, over on the right is another device that's commonly used in signal detection uh, analyses. If you just map the probability of accepting to the right uh, uh, versus the probability of accepting the wrong genotype, so this is the distribution of the G1 in uh, E1. This is the distribution of appearances of G2 and E2. And you plot them, you get this sort of shape curve called a, a, an ROC curve. And uh, what this illustrates is that if females uh, become more or less choosy, they just move up and down across this. And this is, uh, this is where, in this simulation, they should be about that choosy. And if you figure out where they're operating on the receiver operating curve, uh, it turns out that the coefficient of selection is visually just the ratio of uh, how long this line is down to the diagonal versus how long the line is down to there. So it's, I find it a useful way of visualizing this stuff, but it's just a, an interesting tool. So still no, still no migration. We have G by E, but we're, all this is in E1. Um, and that's uh, uh, the game that a female who's in E1 should be playing. Um, and she should be, those females will be selectively eliminating, reducing the f abundance of these guys. Because generation after generation, they're only, they're doing much worse than these guys. And that's the problem. What do you, how can we maintain the variation that keeps females choosy? Uh, why don't they kill the game by getting rid of all the, uh, everybody but the red uh, discs. So uh, let's now get finally to the point of that chapter in uh, 438, okay, um, um, and get to the uh, migration in G by E. So we're going to have migration and condition carryover, and everything we've done so far is females dealing with these males in E1. So G2 in E2, uh, 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 that's mislabeled. That should be uh, E1. Sorry, that should be E1. These are uh, E1, G2, G1. Apologize, I won't try to fix it right now. Now let's uh, take a look at the other environment. And for simplicity, for heuristics, this is a mirror image environment. So it's a perfectly mirror image symmetrical G by E. So now the G2s that grow up in this environment uh, look good, and the G1s that grow up in this environment look bad. And I've just made it symmetrical just to keep it simple. Um, and what we're uh, asking is, what are the consequences of each generation? Some males who developed good condition and uh, big signals uh, in environment two, if they then migrate to environment one and they look like these guys. Okay. Ditto for that. So now we've done, uh, we've created some interesting complications. Uh, if this didn't happen, we would expect this to get smaller and smaller and uh, this to get bigger and bigger. Uh, and pretty soon we got nothing left but G1. Uh, but the same pattern would be going on over here from this female, not shown looking that way. So uh, it, um, this is potential to uh, maintain the distribution, the variance. So if uh, uh, now the distribution of, of appearances for uh, genotype 1 in environment 1 has this long tail. These are uh, genotype environment matches, that is, uh, offspring of these males will be well matched to their environment and should be up here in the next generation. But these guys look crappy because they're hauling their poor condition from the other environment. So we have this long distribution uh, tail. And when we look at the other one, this is a long distribution of, uh, up to there. So uh, this sets up a variance engine. So every time there's local selection to reduce variance, the migration maintains it. In principle, this is not different than uh, the standard ideas about the role of uh, migration uh, selection balance. But in this case, it's maintaining the variation that uh, is necessary to maintain female preferences. 
Um, uh, other ways you can add variance to this machine is you can have, uh, imagine that there's selective migration that only males uh, in good condition migrate. Um, and so that would change those distributions. Or uh, maybe migration is uh, um, costly enough that they degrade in condition. So you can play around with all these things, um, uh, but it becomes obsessive. It's, uh, the, the big picture doesn't change. This is an engine that can maintain variants that can stabilize uh, female preferences. And then an additional part of this is females are in very good condition and uh, should be more choosy, poor condition and be less choosy, and then uh, both of these could be uh, other sources of variance. Now, uh, I, I recommend you buy this book, and uh, you also read uh, the chapter by uh, uh, Holman and Coco, because it's a much better genetic analysis of this, and they uh, uh, capture uh, in much better prose than I use uh, the uh, idea of the Jekyll and Hyde nature of this. This is their phrase, the Jekyll and Hyde nature. Um, so the Jekyll is, the good part is that the uh, G by E with migration maintains the heritable variation that uh, could maintain and stabilize a sexual selection system. The hide is that uh, everybody's migrating a little bit and the value of discriminating is going to go down a little bit. That is, if you guess, if you uh, are uh, G1 female uh, in E1, and you correctly uh, um, uh, choose a G1, uh, G1 male in E1, there is some probability that the offspring will end up migrating. So the migration both creates uh, variation and reduces the benefits of choosiness just a little bit. But uh, uh, the upshot is uh, n not, not enough to uh, crash the whole system. So discrimination gets harder but potentially less beneficial. And I'm not sure how to remove this right now, but uh, Coco uh, have a great, uh, uh, Holman and Coco have a great line. There's ample scope for further theoretical and empirical progress. So both of us have shown in general this can stabilize things, but uh, uh, there's, it's a harder problem than we thought. So this is what it would look like in the standard uh, signal detection layout uh, that I showed you before, but now the, the migrants are not floored out on the uh, uh, x-axis. This is increased migration from uh, the other environment, increased migration from the other environment, continued selection. Uh, the main point of this is that uh, when you put this, put preferences in this continuous quantitative trait uh, framework of signal detection theory, um, the signaling system doesn't crash. It moves very gracefully down to, this is where it was with no migration. This is the ROC curve with some migration. This is uh, how choosy they should be without migration. It moves very gracefully up and down this curve. And so the system is, could end up stabilized anywhere. I wouldn't, I think it's, uh, I haven't tried to give realistic parameter values for any of this because it's really a heuristic exercise. The real qualitative uh, uh, idea is that everything moves smoothly and that you could get stabilization pretty much anywhere along this curve depending on your parameter values. So uh, what uh, um, Holman and Coco conclude is exactly the same thing that this, this uh, is a mechanism to stabilize sexual selection, uh, but there's plenty of room for progress. In retrospect, after all this exercise, uh, it's really not saying anything that people didn't know from evolutionary modeling outside of the uh, sexual selection context, and that is you can have a migration selection balance to maintain uh, variation. In this case, it is a particular manifestation of it that it maintains sexual selection by maintaining a heritable variation in male fitness across the appearance traits. S any questions about that? I'm about to shift gears. Okay. Shifting gears, part two, parental investment, read the joke. So I want to tell you a little bit about a project uh, that um, I've been waiting to complete for almost, uh, for, uh, well, 10 years at least. 
uh, and uh, we're going to finally give up and just publish what we have. And uh, I hope you'll understand what that means uh, by the time I get through it. So this is about uh, uh, parental investment. And this, um, uh, um, let me back up. Uh, so Nancy Burley uh, in the 1980s kind of startled the world of behavioral ecology and sexual selection by, uh, I remember seeing her there, uh, I remember seeing her talk saying, you know, if I, uh, when I put red or blue, green leg bands on my birds, it changes their uh, reproductive success. And everybody thought she was nuts. I mean, there was like a year when people said Nancy Burley is nuts. Uh, but she stuck to it and uh, sure enough, she uh, published uh, several papers showing this data. So these are captive zebra finches in the lab. Uh, and these are uh, males who have red leg bands, randomly assigned males, red leg bands. This is their baby production. Green bands randomly. It's doubles. It doubles uh, putting the red bands on them. Nobody could believe this. You know, eventually people realized, well, pfft, why do males have these big orange cheeks? Uh, females don't have uh, big orange cheeks. Females uh, uh, like red and orange. Uh, it seems to be signaling, and uh, they don't seem to be sophisticated enough to discriminate between a leg band and a natural feather color. So um, give them not all, the males who are given red uh, bands have much higher reproductive success, but they provide much less direct parental care. They feed them babies less. Uh, and this rolls out in uh, lifetime survival. They live longer. Females who mate with them uh, work harder. Uh, I got a red male and they work harder and they actually live less long in the long run. So that was the pattern of, um, and um, Burley uh, cast this uh, in terms of differential allocation uh, uh, to current reproductive effort. Females will uh, make their allocation, investment in reproduction differentially depending on the quality of the opportunity. And for some reason, females think uh, if it's got a red leg band, this is a good opportunity and they'll invest more. If it's a green leg band, this is a crappy opportunity and they'll invest less. Uh, I'm gonna skip through this pretty quickly. Um, the, the, the upshot is this generalizes to uh, uh, just sequential economic uh, investment theory. Again, it's just simple economics. If uh, you have repeated reproductive opportunities from year to year, you're iteroparous, and there are many opportunities. Uh, if by chance this year you have a crappy opportunity, a uh, guy with a green band, they can't be good, uh, it makes sense to uh, reduce your uh, current investment if that increases your survival till next year. Um, whereas if this is a really good year, uh, it seems to make sense to increase your investment and let the future be damned. Um, any rate, uh, I'm going to do some show you that there's theoretical, uh, really, uh, justification for this, but it's a little different than what Burley and others were thinking at the time. So I had a, a PhD student, a uh, terrific student, uh, Natalie Dubois, who now works for the Defenders of Wildlife in Washington, D.C., and was interested in uh, uh, nesting behavior of uh, house wrens. And uh, after a couple of failed starts, we finally got around to this issue of asking whether, uh, well, here's the, here's, the, here's the natural history. They're uh, cavity nesters, uh, males come back, they defend nest cavities, um, and they have this, uh, females come back a couple weeks later, and they search amongst the different males in different uh, uh, territories, and they make a choice and they settle in. And uh, they have some peculiar natural history. Wrens are particularly hated by bluebird lovers because they uh, destroy all the eggs in the neighborhood, toss them out, and create lots of empty nests. So uh, males make empty nests by emptying all the nests around them. And so uh, in our third summer of trying to figure out what would be a good thesis project that might work, uh, we came up with this uh, experimental design to ask, do uh, males toss out eggs and create empty nests because females prefer males that create empty nests? So we had this design where we set out nests in clusters of three, 10 meters between each of these, 50 meters between clusters. One male can defend a nest of clusters. When the males are coming back in the spring, um, uh, two of the boxes 
are plugged. So all, there, all that's available at Lux Arbor Reserve are uh, plots that have one open box. And males come back and they land here and then they defend there and they defend the next one. And uh, every, every day uh, we pair males. This male arrived and this male arrived. We flip a coin and for one of those two, we pop the corks out. So at random, some males, woohoo, I got three nest boxes here. And these guys, okay, well, this is what I settled for and there I am. So now the females start to come back and they choose amongst males. And when we uh, worked out this design in the winter, we had a bedding pool in the lab. And I wanna uh, see if I can get a little audience engagement here. Um, if you were a female house wren sorting around between males to settle with, who would you prefer? A male with three empty nest boxes or a male with uh, one empty nest box? One. One. That's what I bet, and why is that? Why, so why, why okay, one box, guys. Why would you th uh, argue one? Well, that's, that's actually flipped. So I thought one box because they're facultatively polygynous, and uh, you don't have to worry about this guy having a second female. So I should have told you the facultative, the polygynous stuff, right? So I was th I'm thinking, uh, you know, if you choose this guy, uh, a couple days later, he might have a second mate, and then crap, there are two of us here, and I don't, I don't want that. I'd rather be there. So I, that's a direct benefits thinking. That is, so they're choosing them because I'll get all of his attention. Sorry, this, I'll get all of his attention. He won't be provisioning two nests, and I won't have to put up with that other female. Uh, and uh, uh, other people in my lab bet this. Why would you bet? that. Why might females prefer the three box one? Yeah, what might, why might, what would be your story that you would spin on top of that? Well, he was able, he was strong enough to defend all three nests. Absolutely, that's exactly it. This guy must be good, otherwise how could he defend these nests? He's got to be better than that crappy guy who can only defend the one nest territory. So I was betting on one nest because I was a direct help guy. And here's what Natalie found over two years, um, and, and we published this, uh, that uh, this has uh, uh, no, em no empty nests, so this is one box territory, this is three box territories. Uh, females uh, lay bigger clutches if they settle with a one box male, and uh, I'm sorry, a three box male, and the clutch is, uh, sex ratio is significantly more male biased. So it looks for all the world, like females who get a uh, uh, three box male are like the red leg finches. It's like, well, this is a good opportunity. I got a good father for my offspring this year. Let's go for it. Um, and um, there it was. So it uh, looks like indirect benefits it is uh, for two years. And we published that. And then it got more interesting. Uh, so here's Natalie. Um, we uh, published that. And now we turn to the curious case of the disappearing differential allocation. So these are the two years of Natalie's work up here in green because of the green hat. And this is the difference in clutch size from three box to one box. And those are, uh, that was her data. And then she went on, Natalie went on to a postdoc, and Lindsay Walters came in to do some slightly different stuff, but we said, let's continue this protocol because uh, it's easy. And the first year, woohoo, uh, we got more. Uh, although I don't know why I woohooed that because we'd already published it, and who can publish a paper saying, yeah, we were right? Uh, because actually, what happened was, oh no, it went away. What happened? Uh, it stopped happening. So this is 2005, six, seven uh, here. So this is kind of embarrassing because we'd already published this result. <clears throat> and so we, of course, uh, launched a, an intense, 
Oh, I'm watching the clock. I'm going to pull a soul right here if I'm not careful. Uh, we, uh, we started looking for lurking variables. Are the boxes getting older? No, we replaced them. Are the females getting older? No, they turn over in the uh, none of that. Uh, there, uh, at KVS, you can hardly walk without bumping into a sticky trap. Are there insects uh, abundance changing? No, I don't, uh, nothing. We could not find anything that we could identify that might be causing this to disappear. But we noticed this. And that is, uh, all the years when we had this, we had uh, a lot of empty boxes. So the density of birds out there was low, and there were a lot of empty boxes. And then when we didn't get it anymore, the, uh, the, with the occupied territories, was the, all the boxes were full. And they say, well, wait, this must have something to do with population density or something. And so I went back and I said, OK, so I understand the logic of um, differential allocation. You have a good opportunity, uh, 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 dump it all in. You have a bad opportunity, maybe you should save for next year and hope you'll be in a better, uh, uh, have a better situation next year. That all uh, seemed to make sense. Here's the uh, actual data on clutch sizes. Um, and uh, if you look at it, so here's the uh, three box clutch sizes, one box, box clutch sizes. And uh, this is where Lindsay took over, so it's not Lindsay. And this is what it went to. They're, they're exactly the same across those. What? I'm stuck, and it's a little embarrassing. We published this paper. Uh, and I realized that the abundance was changing. So if you go to the uh, uh, USGS uh, breeding bird survey data, uh, we're in the Mississippi Flyway. These are uh, 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 population abundance index of house wrens in the Mississippi Flyway. Right here we are. And the dots are the, the trend. And there's a strange, intriguing pattern here. This is when Natalie set up her study, and we got uh, a significant um, differential allocation. And this is Lindsay. She got differential allocation, and then it disappeared. And it corresponds exactly, coincidence? Mm, I don't think so, but uh, uh, with this crash. What's this about? What, uh, anybody, any birders in here have an idea of why that happened? That is when West Nile virus swept through uh, the Midwest. And uh, house wrens were particularly hammered. And I don't know if that's because they're in nest cavities and the mosquitoes cornered them or what. This is when West Nile virus came through. And we got this tremendous treatment effect of one box, three box. And we've been watching ever since. And we never get, we do this every year, and we never get uh, an effect anymore between one box and three box. I'm getting tired of waiting. Uh, so how, what? What, how does this make sense? Well, if you go back then and, and figure out what's this differential allocation all about, and I'll start rushing now, uh, it, you can take it all the way back to uh, Fisher, who made this uh, uh, rather infamous statement um, uh, that by analogy to compound interest, it can, it's easy to see that the reproductive value of, a, uh, of an individual at any event of reproduction uh, looks like this. What the heck? Uh, what's this reproductive value? It, it's easy to see. It's easily seen. Well, if you go back and look at uh, uh, simpler introductory texts to uh, life history theory, Ted Case has got a pretty nice book on it, although it's got a lot of errors in it. It's a pretty nice book. Uh, you can uh, uh, learn a lot about reproductive value of an individual. And, and a reproductive value uh, of an individual we expect to be maximized. Evolution should select for maximization of reproductive value at each stage of life. It depends on current reproduction and future reproduction. Current reproduction, future reproduction. So uh, I'm going to deconstruct that a little but quickly because I'm running out of time. So if we uh, try to sort out uh, differential allocation as a function of reproductive value and opportunities this year versus next year, uh, you have um, uh, the um, births this year, offspring reproduction, is a function of the effort, which is a function of quality or condition. So those, those, that's uh, this year's reproduction. But uh, that has a negative feedback, uh, you assume, uh, on uh, survival till next year. This is survival till next year. Um, and then this is a reproductive value next year. 
And so you can just iterate this as a recursive equation. Um, and what you assume is that evolution is selecting to maximize uh, this at each stage by balancing this trade-off. And it'll balance differently depending on the quality of the opportunity. So the balance changes depending on uh, Q. But the thing that got completely lost from all the discussion from Nancy Burley's leg bands looking at captive populations of finches is this thing uh, that lambda is in the denominator. So the whole reproductive value life history trade-off is modulated by population growth rate in the denominator. And that uh, is going to uh, change this. So the value of saving for the future is discounted by the population growth rate. And this is just basic elementary economics for young individuals. And I apologize for this. But uh, it makes less sense. The value of saving diminishes as inflation erodes the future value. And uh, the same logic applies to future offspring. And I'm going to rush on this. So lambda was lost, uh, uh, and rightly so, because the lambda was 1. And who would write 1 in the denominator of an equation? Um, if you look at how sensitive the optimal clutch size is to variation in the quality of mates, uh, again, as a, a very simplistic heuristic model, you end up with, in the denominator, offspring sur adult survival and offspring survival. Anytime uh, adult or offspring survival increases, uh, the uh, differential benefits, the sensitivity of clutch, optimal clutch size to variance in quality goes down. So uh, you expect there to be less differential allocation when lambda is big and more differential allocation when lambda is low. Right? I have a great opportunity. I have a crappy opportunity. I should save for the future. But next year, if I have an extra egg, everybody else is having extra eggs too. And I'm really not better off because uh, 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 the population is inflating the way money is inflating. So what we have here in all this are some statements and equations about theory, which I only dug into because the empirical work generated a pattern that just didn't make any sense to us. So we started to go back, and let's, uh, you know, it's just sort of uh, uh, an assumption that's often useful to say, let's suppose nature makes sense and we're confused because we don't understand why it makes sense. And so we dug back through uh, Fisher and uh, those models and realized that it's very sensitive to lambda. But this is only a, uh, so the pattern fits, but it's only a kind of unreplicated anecdote. It's, uh, we, don't, we don't have no replication on this. And we've been watching these things year after year after year, and the population just keeps growing and growing and growing. And uh, I'm getting tired of it. So uh, most basically, we're going to just break this down and write a little theoretical note uh, uh, to say to everybody, if you're studying differential allocation, don't forget to pay attention to lambda. Because if you do a literature review, uh, uh, there's a lot of studies, particularly in Europe, on, uh, on uh, various um, um, uh, species in Europe that get completely opposite uh, uh, data. Some, one study in one location will get a positive uh, differential allocation effect. And another study using exactly the same methodology at a different time or a different year gets no effect. And uh, everybody just scratches their head the way we did. So I think it'll be useful for people to realize, well, at least it's worth a look to see what's happening to the population growth uh, on there. Um, and just as a quick plug, I'm watching the clock. Uh, 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 Lindsay did some follow-up work uh, looking at uh, egg color as a signal uh, to mates. It turns out that Lindsay found out that, uh, so egg color varies. Uh, if you pay extra money for brown chicken eggs, you should know that browner, when chickens get sick, their eggs get browner. Uh, because the brown is, uh, is a uh, metabolic waste product that they deposit more of. At any rate, uh, Natalie, I'm sorry, Lindsay switched eggs around. There's a lot of variation in painted eggs. And it turns out that males look at the color of the eggs their female mate is uh, lay, uh, laying. And uh, if uh, most of her eggs are dark, males provision less when the babies are uh, hatched. If most of the eggs are pale, 
they provision much more. So males are uh, making these sorts of things, but it doesn't solve our lambda thing. And I'm way over, so I'll just say watch for papers by all of these people. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, mostly what I'm doing uh, is trying to supervise cool projects by postdocs and grad students. And uh, I'll leave that up if anybody wants to ask me about any of those. And now if somebody knows how to turn on the lights, I'm done. <laughs> Yes. So that last story, it seems like you're suggesting the Ren can detect a pretty hard Lambda? Parameter. Yeah, one of the reasons that I find this uh, experimentally tractable or intractable, and I've kind of given up, is what's the scale? Right? So uh, it's possible, and we haven't done it, that all they're doing is counting empty nest boxes as a rule of thumb. If there are lots of empty nest boxes, uh, that's correlated with uh, lambda with lag integrated over time. But uh, it's, it's equally plausible. They're, they're neotropical migrants. They spend the winter down on the coast. Uh, so the scale of how they would do this is uh, a little bit mind-boggling for me. Uh, and that's part of the, one of the reasons uh, we haven't, we've just been standing back hoping there would be another West Nile uh, uh, <laughs> attack. <laughs> So yeah, it's you know that's a that's a problem with any any of this optimality approach to to behavioral ecology. You know, you uh, it's what information and how could they possibly know that? Um, don't know. But uh, it, it, in that in our case, it maps pretty well onto empty nest boxes, and it also maps onto lambda. And I think they could probably count empty nest boxes better than calculate lambda. Okay, it's a little late. Yeah, so sorry. Come on up if you have questions. Yeah, if you want to talk. Thank you. Them. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have run so long if I hadn't spent all that time talking about Sewell Wright running so long. Uh, <laughs>